Right. Well, uh, welcome. This is the third panel in our We Reach Biomedical Entrepreneurship Boot Camp. And the topic today is budgets and funding sources. So it does come down to that. You won't get too far without being able to properly budget and convince people to put some money into the project. So I'm Terry Butler. I'm the Associate Director of Outreach and Partnerships for the We Reach Biomedical Entrepreneurship Center, which officially just kicked off today. And I also run the Institute of Translational Health Sciences Drug and Device Advisory Committee, which is a group of people who have deep expertise in product development and regulatory processes. All right, well, let's have the panelists introduce themselves. Alice, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Alice Chen. I'm with Accelerator Life Science Partners. Uh, we're an investment vehicle for early stage life sciences, mostly in therapeutics. I understand that there are a lot of diagnostics and devices uh, projects here, but I'll also try to infuse a little bit of therapeutics point of view for folks who might be uh, watching us um, in the future. And um, chemical engineer by background, um, <laughs> working engineering and okay. um, work-wise, uh, I'm in, on the investment side, before that in biotech company startup and before that at pharma. So if there is any questions in, in that front, please feel free to, to raise them. Uh, hi, my name is Derek Street. Um, I'm a technology entrepreneur, so I've, uh, which basically means that I'm perpetually unemployable. So if anybody becomes an entrepreneur, <laughs> that's what happens. Um, so I've built five venture-backed uh, technology companies. Two, the last two have been in healthcare, which is where I I uh, devote all my attention now, both for a nonprofit. Um, I won't go through all of them, but um, the most recent one was a company called uh, CSAS, which we uh, spun out of the University of Washington with a physician partner at Seattle Children's Hospital. And it was a system to um, accurately evaluate and predict and then improve the performance of surgeons by training machines to first humans and then eventually machines to evaluate their their surgical videos, and then we sold um, that system to large healthcare companies or large healthcare institutions. Uh, that company was purchased by Johnson and Johnson um, was under two years ago. Um, I left J and J uh, late last year, and I'm starting to work on my sixth company now. Okay. <clears throat> my name is Glenna Thacker, and I am a healthcare CEO and consultant. Have been for many years. Startups, mergers, acquisitions. Um, I also do perform forensic audits and valuations for, for companies. Um, my, uh, I, my consulting business is advanced negotiations, um, <laughs> but I also am part of a medical device startup in Medix, and we are in the process of taking, our, taking through our 510K um, submission right now. Um, my educational background is physics. Um, so not quite sure how that led me into <laughs> finance and healthcare, but I needed a there we job. Have it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Will Canastero, I'm managing director at Washington Research Foundation, WF Capital. Uh, WF does two things. So we give gifts to researchers at Washington State Research Institutions to advance technologies out of the institution. So if you guys, that fits the description there, you should come talk to me afterwards. We also have WF Capital, which is our brand for doing investing. We have about $5 million of early stage investing each year, focused on healthcare and life sciences. Prior to that, I'm a recovering health economist. And so uh, I got my PhD here in health economics and outcomes research in the School of Pharmacy. Uh, during the PhD, I did consulting for uh, pharmaceuticals and reimbursement and market access strategies. Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, can you describe some business models of organizations you've worked with? I know you've all worked with really different kinds of business models. And when you're talking about biotech, it's very different than, say, a medical device and what you're aiming for. So let's. Sure. Um, so kind of the structures, business models. Um, so since we're mostly in therapeutics, diagno companion diagnostics, the business model is and we're also in early stage. So a lot of times it's mostly R&D and then find an exit, whether it's uh, Series B uh, acquisition by biopharma companies or IPO. So those are the kind of things that, uh, that we look forward to. And so for us, business model a lot of times um, surrounds uh, or around R&D development. So you move the R&D along and it gets to a further and further stage, looks more and more promising and exactly. the value increases and then that might at that point, help us sell or become a company, a bigger 
a funded com company. Gotcha. Yeah, we're just going to go down the line. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, sure. yeah. Um, I guess I would say, so in terms of like how I've charged um, customers for the uh, for the products that I've sold and the companies that I've, I've been part of, um, it's been a it, there's a wide variety, and that's probably um, less important to me. I mean, there's like CSAT was a business that, and, th and this is all digital, by the way. I, I don't know anything about um, therapeutics or devices, but in but in the digital world, right? So, so CSAT was a is a SaaS business model. We had a, you know, there are kind of upfront um, installation fees and so forth that you you have for, which is are common for those kind of systems. And then, um, but but the real money is made on a, uh, and the recurring revenue is made on a on an annual um, uh, subscription, usually tied to some sort of volume that that uh, is that your product's being used for. Uh, but I also have an advertising business, um, which is more about you know getting a bunch of eyeballs and then you know. Um, you know, aggregating a random demographic and then um, um, arbitraging to sell a targeted one. And so there are a lot of models that you can apply. I would say the bigger sort of challenges is, especially in healthcare, is figuring out um, who has enough pain plus budget that you can actually, um, and, you know, times enough of them that you can actually build a business on it. If you can figure that out, then figuring out like how to charge somebody for something is kind of the easy part. My experience. Uh, well, that's very snappy. We'll have to. <laughs> Reuse those terms, pain plus budget. And I'm saying pain, pain can decide too, because like a lot of times and the decision budget, maker, yeah. the decision maker can be someone off from the other part of the organization. Yeah, too, interesting, so. especially in healthcare. You're right; it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Glennis? Well, um, I actually started out um, in um, hospital and clinic and inventory surgery center setups, and then. Um, most of my clients would come to me either through word of mouth or through the attorneys and accountants um, saying they wanted to do the startup. Is it viable? And so some of the work I do is also forensic audits. Um, through that, I started having um, people come to me again, usually lawyers and accountants saying um, medical device startup. Um, how can they get paid? Who's going to how do we get the insurance company to pay for this? How do you go about getting um, what's a CPT code a di uh, or a diagnosis code matched with the CPT code, a new CP code if you need it? And at what stage do you do that? And what we found is um, a lot of people in that process don't understand that, uh, first of all, it, you know, determine who your end user is, how, determines how it's going to get paid. If it's an insurance company, they want to be involved very early on. They want to be involved in your pre-submission process to the FDA. So... Um, that's kind of how I ended up in the life sciences here, but also through my own medical device startup. Yeah, so there's been like good descriptions of pharma and health IT and devices. So I guess one area that's not been covered is uh, bioinformatics or life science tools. And so uh, we've, we have a few of those in our portfolio. And so the the strategy there, I think there's two things you can do. One is just there's, uh, you know, kits or have it used by researchers, some small uh, component mixture that someone can buy uh, almost directly. All those things are usually not uh, under FDA uh, regulation, so it's a little bit faster to get out. Uh, it oftentimes requires like a scientist to scientist interaction, a little lower price, but you're kind of contingent upon volumes. So you're trying to push those out over time and you're looking for return business. And so that's really about relationships between the CEO, oftentimes the CEO scientist who's going out and pushing that, uh, trying to trying to drive revenue. Uh, and then you know, you'll usually see that start out, sort of build credibility. They'll go to conferences, they'll pitch that. They're trying to get to the, the bigger fish, which is, you know, joint development or having someone pay a large sum of money to actually do something. They'll push the platform forward. And then hopefully that moves towards an acquisition. So you see similar in a, in a, in a pharma bios, biotech space. So um, a little bit of a mixture there. Great. Thank you. So most of our people here are bench researchers or um, students and one thing they need to do if they're going to start to hypothesize what this business looks like is to create budgets. So where can they go to find realistic numbers to estimate the types of people they need, the costs, and where, what would be your recommendations? 
Should we start somewhere else? I, I feel yeah. bad always having a question. Maybe, maybe reverse yeah. reverse. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'd say before you start looking for numbers, figure out what you should do. And so talk to a lot of people and figure out, no, don't get a number for something. So you know that something is the right something to do. Um, and so the biggest question that I would have if I'm looking at something is just what's the scope of work? Where do you want to end up? And are these steps kind of getting you in that pathway? And there's all sorts of questions you can ask to get better and higher resolution numbers and that budget. But oftentimes you can have really high detail uh, numbers for something that's completely irrelevant and not going to push in the right direction. So I would say, you know, first, um, you know, talk to customers or figure out exactly what you have to do to kind of push you on the right path before you waste a ton of energy uh, getting, getting numbers. I, I would agree with that. In, in your initial pro forma, your initial budget, um, don't get weighed down in detail initially because it's going to take turns here and there before you get to that final pro forma. So initially, look at the big picture of where you're going, um, who your market is, so you have an idea of, of you know, the um, income side of that, and then your rough rough numbers for your expenses. One thing I will say, though, even in your initial pro forma, and I do this in all of mine, um, is always overestimate um, your expenses and underestimate your income. Give yourself a little bit of cushion because there will always be a surprise that comes up and it's nice to have that cushion. Uh, yeah, I guess my advice would be, um, well, I guess since we're talking about funding, I, I'm just going to assume that, or this finance is that I assume that most people would be looking for some outside funding, especially if you're doing a, some stuff that's regulated or something like that. So, so assuming that's the case, then I would, um, uh, I would, you know, it sounds bad, but I, I wouldn't focus a lot on, it, especially the cost side, because um, it's kind of, kind of doesn't matter at this stage, right? Like, like if you were going to bootstrap it and and it was it was you know you you, you were going to bootstrap it and, and that's all the money you had, then then it's it's critical to uh, to to figure that out. But I, I doubt many many um, I mean Alice would know best, but I'm assuming that a lot of blockbuster therapeutics don't get bootstrapped by you know <laughs> by somebody in a garage somewhere. So so you know you're going to raise money, and what's going to matter is then revenue opportunity, market size, all those kinds of things. I would put a lot more effort into that. And then when you, and then you need to be able to uh, justify the round you're gonna raise. But um, what I've always done is I just sort of backed into it, right? I said, okay, I need, you know, I know it's gonna, no matter what I think, it's gonna require me a couple of years of runway to figure this thing out and get the right team on board and so forth. So if I need a couple of years of runway and here's kind of the revenue I think I could generate and it, there may be no revenue in a therapeutic for a long time, then, um, then here's how much money I need. And then you kind of make your costs in your team because your costs at this point are really going to be people you know, to do things. You make them fit. Um, and part of that is a little bit um, dependent on how much you can raise as well, right? If you've done it more and have more connections and so forth, then you, know, you can probably raise more money than if not. So a little bit of it's sort of a, um, an iterative process where you're like, you know, if I, could, if I think I can get a million bucks, then that's going to tell me what kind of cost structure I can afford because I got to make that last a couple of years. Um, and then you kind of back into it that way. But I would focus on the front end, the revenue side, the market opportunity or the market opportunity if you're going to be a ways from revenue because that's what's going to, that's the key piece that's going to get you into getting uh, funding in the first place versus showing up with a really detailed analysis of, you know, your cost of goods, you know, on something when you don't even, you haven't even like made it. So I completely agree with uh, what the panelist has already said and in the context of therapeutics. And also, I think this is generally applicable for a lot of startups as well outside of therapeutics. Start with the milestones that you would like to accomplish. And to set the milestones, obviously, start with the big pictures. It, are you solving a big problem that people care about? Is it something that there will be a buyer for or there will be a financier for? So understand that you're in the right area then set the milestones in that space. So for therapeutics, it could be, is it in, in vivo animal proof of concept? Is it human proof of concept? Is it regulatory milestones that you're trying to accomplish? Once you set the milestones, you then figure out the timeline and the budget that will get you there, right? And so once you set the timeline and the budget, you'll have a sense of, it's almost like a menu for the, um, for the fundraising and say, this is how much money will get you to this kind of milestones. So how do you get to that budget knowing the milestones? You can then break it into the R&D and the non-R&D. Totally agree that, you know, always 
always overestimate how much you're going to spend and underestimate, uh, underestimate the income. And for therapeutics, a lot of times, unless there are side projects that will get you to early income, a lot of times there is no income for a long time to come. In that sense, you'll have to, uh, you'll have to be able to, to account for that kind of contingencies. And so on the R&D side, a lot of the, that would be money for people, money for space, money for equipments, etc. And so then you go down to the details, but definitely start with the big pictures before you go into the nitty gritties. Um, also the iteration process, um, be open to feedback from the investment side, um, because a lot of times perhaps there is, um, you might have some preconceived notion of what would be a good inflection point, but if you're open-minded uh, when there are feedback from the investment side, you might have some new ideas to help you drive toward a, a revised milestone or multiple milestones um, that will help you better structure something that's more financeable. So. Great. I think, so, yeah, I think when talking to people too, you're getting that feedback, like you, they're going to give you a sense of like, if you have magical thinking in the numbers too, it's like, if there's like, <laughs> if, if people are laughing at like the cost of things, um, or they don't think it's right, that, 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 that process and working with funders and describing it, it, it will be iterative as Alice is saying. So I can, I hold, that's a, I hold a lot of agree with that. It's a process. It's not like you're going to go back and figure out something completely on your own and then uh, have it be funded. So it's a conversation. So to not be embarrassed by going with some numbers and talking to people and having best, them best give guess. you feedback, and then on out the feedback yeah. reality checks. It's not going to cost yeah. you three hundred dollars. It's going to cost you. It's not on the space station. You're doing it, so yeah. <laughs> <Right. So. laughs> and where would be good places where people could look for these kinds of numbers, uh, just as to give them ballparks? And another question with that might be at close for you, especially a lot of people have biomedical devices, and they will be reimbursed, hopefully. Somewhere. So how do they figure that out? And well, you can answer this as well. So I think there's things you can know about prices. So if you're buying a product off the shelf and that you're incorporating that in your process, that's one place to look, obviously. And then for things that you won't know about, like the cost of an engineer at this level, I'd say that going with people that have done the process before or a more experienced entrepreneur and talk to them and, and sort of, there's sort of uh, rules of thumb or set levels you can expect. And you don't, you wouldn't necessarily know that unless you've done the process before. So I think getting feedback from uh, a more experienced entrepreneur would be a really good place to start and have that kind of feedback. And they'll let you know this is within range or out of range. Uh, so I'd say that's part of that, that process. Um, yeah. So I'd, I'd, I, would, I would start with that. So things you can figure out just in uh, public access, there's no, there's usually not like proprietary databases for costs of different prices of things. Um, but then uh, there would be sort of like rules of thumb for salary or space. Like those are things you can figure out just by talking with people, talk with a real estate agent and those kinds of things. So if you're in the med medical device realm and you're looking f that you want the insurance companies to be um, paying for this in the, on the patient's behalf, um, you have to consider it has to fit into the different code sets that the insurers use to pay with. Um, the, I would say the first thing you want to do there, there are manuals you can look at if you, if your device is something that's similar to something that's already out there look and see what the similar is first and can a modifier be used? Maybe you don't even have to apply for a new code, um, but kind of in, in the same fashion, find whatever you can that's similar out there first, but that's, that's where I would start. And again, as I said earlier, the important thing is um, knowing that if you want insurance companies to pay for a medical device, you need to get them involved early. They want to be on the phone calls for the pre-submission um, interviews for the FDA. Um, and then the process of, if you do have to come up with a new CPT code, that also takes time. Um, and you have to work with both the FDA and the AMA to get those put into place, get those approved. And it all take, it takes time. That should be budgeted that, in. It, but it's budgeted in, and, and they will only do that two times a year. So um, you have to budget that in as well. And so moving to the funding side, if a team comes to you, especially Bill, uh, Alice, and is seeking funding, what are your alarm bells? What sets off your alarm bells? 
Uh, maybe I'll start with what we look for. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. Well, well, good alarms. Start yes. Yeah, good alarms. <laughs> um, so the, obviously for, for us, science is number one, right? Is the science robust? Are there validating data uh, for us uh, to, to chew on and be... Um, be satisfied with the, the progress or have a clear line of sight to those kind of um, scientific validation. So data robustness is definitely something we look for. Um, and then I think next time you'll, you'll talk about IP in your next session. And so those are the things, is it, it's great science, is it protectable? Is it something that's developable? So those are also things that we definitely look at. Uh, people, uh, that's uh, a, a probably the most important component um, in terms of coming, uh, evaluating a, a team dynamic we will look for are the, uh, are the team members experts in what they need to know and are the expertise of the team um, complementing each other? Can they work with each other uh, in the long, uh, in, in long term situations? Because you know, whether it's biotech or some any other startups, these are tough times. Uh, ahead, and so is it something? Or do they have the right personalities to to work, work with each other and work with the rest of the team that will come together? Um, and also, uh, yeah, and also evaluate the potential for the next step. Whether it's the next step is uh, further funding, are there market interests, are there strategic interests in those programs? Those are the key things that we really evaluate. I, would, I I wouldn't disagree with any of those. I think that's a great response. Then the only so we uh, at WF we have a pretty narrow funnel. So we're you know we have a preference for things with IP from Washington State Research Institution. So that's where we're starting, uh, and then so we'll, oftentimes we'll see things multiple times, and so some will come in when it's very early, and so one of the things that we're looking for is we give them some feedback or we ask questions, and how is that feedback taken and incorporated the next time they come back around, and if it's not, that's that's kind of a bad sign. Um, also, you know I. I've, I finished my PhD and I had the expectation you're supposed to be an expert in something. You're supposed to like dig down, like know something really well. But you know, you, when you're funding, you're looking at lots of things across lots of different areas. You're not gonna be an expert in everything. So you're asking really simple general questions and then how someone responds sort of will lift the lift the hood and let you know that they've thought about that before, the level of sophistication, their answer. And so I think having, you don't have to get everything across right away when you do a pitch, like you should have sort of a clean story, but the ability to, when a simple question is asked about, like Alice is saying the IP, you have a very clean and clear explanation for that. You can go into it, the regulatory strategy. So preparation for that and how someone is prepared to answer those questions are really important because it's the same kinds of questions, all the things that Alice is mentioning. Those are similar questions to every technology we look at and the, the level that someone can uh, describe that um, in, with some simple questions. I would also add sometimes, um, and, and this seems very simple, but you'd be surprised when, when you get pitched things. Um, ask yourself, when you is it really needed? Is it really necessary? Because um, there are a lot of ideas out there that people come up with, which, oh, that's a nice idea. That would be nice. But is it really necessary? Is it really needed? And sometimes the answer is no. So you really do have to think about the end user and how necessary is this? Is it necessary enough that enough people are going to want to want to pay to buy it and to use it? Yeah. One more thing that we, <laughs> that we definitely look for, which is differentiation. So it has to be a, a addressing a question at, or a problem uh, that people care about. And also your solution needs to be different from anything else that's out there. If you, if you can articulate that, then, then you're one step ahead of other people. That cycles back to what we talked about in the first panel, which was competitive analysis. So know what's out there and know how you compare. Talking to investors. So Derek, you, working on platforms that connect people, basically we have uh, some of those kinds of products out here, either patient connecting with physician or uh, person, individual connecting with health information. So how, how do those work and how do you figure out, I mean, different, those can be paid for different ways, depending on who your customer is. How do you figure out who your customer is and then how to reach those customers and get them to pay for the product? Yeah. So, um, so in terms of, it depends, I guess, I guess how you look at it. Uh, I mean, I guess if you can look at it a certain way, many things in the digital health space are that way. So, mm -hmm. so, and certainly platform, I mean, I think you're talking about platforms and then kind of communities there. So there's two things which aren't necessarily one of the same, but, but, you know, if you think of a platform as like something that, um, 
that can be utilized across use cases and um, uh, ideally for multiple meaningful pain points, right? That's um, that's some that that the first thing that does is that increases your optionality of things that you can uh, that you can monetize them at that point, right? So so if we go back to CSATs, for example, which was much less kind of a community, um, although there were community aspects of it, but it was very much a platform, right? It was and and it started out as a uh, my 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 clinical partner started out as very much a training education kind of kind of platform that was one use case but and and there was a little bit of budget there but unfortunately in healthcare you know the the people that are newest and need the most training are the ones that get the budget taken away from um, which is a whole different problem um but we eventually found that um, while that was kind of one place to go then what we could do is we could improve we could also improve the efficiency of certain service lines or departments inside a hospital so what that did is that opened up a different use case a different budget um, use at a departmental level. And so now our contracts went from, you know, um, you know, four and five figure dollar contract, five figure contracts to six to six figure contracts, which then got us thinking about and opened up the opportunity to go now at an institutional level across the health systems and um, first improve quality that had a economic benefit uh, to the health system. But then where we found the, the big budgets and where we ultimately ended up doing multi-year, multi-million dollar contracts was when we were able to tie what we were doing to uh, the risk and liability inside of a large health system where they were spending billions of dollars a year on malpractice claims. And if our system could be used to get eyes on a surgeon and start reducing those claims, you know, you could you could save them a lot of money and they would give you a, a healthy piece of that. And so the point is, I'm very much a believer in platforms because they give you this ability to uh, extend across use cases and um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I'm not an institutional VC, but I, I, I do angel investing. And I certainly, when I do, I, I look for things that have that optionality because um, if you're like a third right, when you start it out, start out your startup, like you're going to be crushing it. You're almost, you're going to be wrong about just about everything. And so um, if you have that, those opportunities to kind of go different ways, then you can find those pay points. And then back to my earlier kind of comment, then it kind of doesn't matter how you charge or whatever, because you found the pain and you've got these different ways you can go and then you just you just start matching up you just try different ways to charge them for it but you're going to eventually figure it out if it's a real if it's a real pain well, that yes. Question. yeah no that's nice and that also demonstrates how tech products uh you you can start one place and just keep iterating as you start learning more about the system and more about different opportunities it's a little trickier with medical devices or therapeutics where you have to plan more ahead and get regulation milestones met. Well, one it, thing I will say on that, um, and I'm not a device person, but we ended up uh, unintentionally getting pulled into the device world in order yeah. to make our system work um, best. It wasn't re it wasn't a requirement, but in order to provide the best uh, experience for the customer, we ended up uh, creating a piece of hardware that uh, was resonant in the operating room and essentially. Um, um, captured the videos that were being that, that were being done there, and then uploaded them into our cloud service, and then did, did the analytics there. So there was a lot of, as anybody in the clinical environment knows, like you know, it, it may be an easy technical mm -hmm. challenge of flipping a switch to open a network port, but it's you know, it's twelve months of political process to, to get <laughs> the ability to do that. So it wasn't a regulated device, but um, my, my point in mentioning it is that um, we found that. Um, that, and I would think a lot of devices these days would be this way that, um, you know, the hardware, I mean, I just came from 15 months at Johnson and Johnson and, and they're very focused on digital surgery now. And, and what they realize is that the value of the plastic and metal is, even though they kind of own many big markets selling plastic and metal in operating rooms is not there. It's about the software and the services and the data that you mm -hmm. can wrap around it. And so if I was starting a device company, I would absolutely make sure that I've got a software services data play that I can wrap around it. And again, that provides an optionality of finding additional. Um, so, so I guess my point is, is I'm not, I could, I, and this could be totally wrong. I could be a failure as a device person, but if I was starting a device company, I would probably approach it the way I approached the digital side because I look for that differentiation and that value on the software and services I could wrap around this device that I got into this clinical setting somewhere. Mm -hmm. And Glennis, you're in the hot seat yes. of that within <laughs> medics now. Yes. And, and that's true. And, it, um, 
you get that question a lot from investors, um, even with your medical devices, you know, is it a, is this a SaaS um, related? And, and it is important um, because with many medical devices, um, you do want to have a bigger oper- operability. You want to know, can they, inter- can they um, uh, connect with the, EHRs, the medical systems that the hospitals or the clinics are using, can they do that seamlessly? Um, I'll just say Kaiser for one, Kaiser Permanente, um, won't allow anyone to use their um, Wi-Fi in their clinics or hospitals. So if if you have a medical device that you're going to have to, that you're using in the cloud, you're going to have to build into your, your device something that will take care of that so you don't have to use it. So absolutely, um, even with medical devices, you have to be thinking um, platform, you have to be thinking bigger and you have to be thinking interoperability. Great, thank you. So uh, one other general question pertaining to funding, when should teams think about pursuing uh, outside funding? I I think there, there's probably a balance, right? So you wanna be getting feedback from people early and so, um, I don't know if you have a similar experience working in tech. I heard a tech investor describe as you, you know, ask for advice, get money, ask for money, get advice. And that seemed to seem to be a good way to describe it. Like you're out, you're out sort of socializing an idea, getting feedback, uh, and you'll get a sense of when the time is right and the questions you're getting, when there's a certain theme to it. And they're going to, you're going to know pretty quickly if you talk to 20, 30 people, if there's a sort of good appetite for it or not. Um, and then also what are the questions that come up? And so I wouldn't talk, I wouldn't go search for funding until you had answers to those questions. You understood it. Uh, you knew who to target. Um, and I think that, you know, having a sense of what type of investor is the right level to start at, too. So do some initial groundwork beforehand and figure out uh, what type of investor you want to uh, deal with. And what are the questions they have uh, would be where I would start with it. And then I think that once you have that feedback, you'll start to know if the time is right or not. So it's not always quite clear if it's a really far out opportunity, really uh, it's a big, big market. Uh, you might have people invested really early because they're really excited about the potential of it. If it's a smaller market, it might have to be a little further along in development too. So it's always a case by case basis, but that's why it makes sense to go and talk to people about it. And maybe I'll add to that a little bit in terms of uh, when you look for investors, always look for the value add beyond money. Um, so what can your investors bring to the project? Is it scientific technical expertise? Is it governance? Is it development uh, capabilities? Or is it network? So what kind of value add can potential investors bring to the table? Definitely start taking notes. uh, And you will get that through communications and through socializing your ideas with them. And they'll give you feedback. You can you can go and see if that feedback is right or not. So like if you're if they're telling something that's completely off the wall, you'll find out. Like that you'll see you'll see if they're credible or not. And there are different levels of funding, and different investors like to invest at different levels. There are investors who want to be in at the very beginning at your A seed level, and there are some who say, you know, we're not interested till you already have a product and you're you have a company and you're at this level. And and again, that just takes talking to them, but. When you do go out and you start talking to people, someone may say, you know, it's too early for me, but network called this person or I'll call this person, I'll make this introduction. But um, as Al said, absolutely, um, money isn't the only thing you get when you go out and talk to investors. You get you get a lot of important um, ideas uh, on all aspects of your business, whether it's financial or technical or clinical. Or, yeah. I, I'm sorry. No. I, I also think it it it's very sort of entrepreneur uh, specific, meaning um, it, it's got you got to decide what what you're comfortable with. I mean, um, I've always been of the mind that um, you want financial partners on board as early as possible. Um, it gives you more of an opportunity to uh, build something bigger, um, and plus you. You know, when you it's a pretty lonely process when you're starting out, even with a co-founder or something. So, like, you, you know, it helps to have some people that are on board that are kind of pulling with you. Um, now, the best I take a dollar of revenue over a dollar of, of uh, venture money any day. Um, no offense, but 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 but, you know, it, you could be pretty far away from revenue. Right. So so my advice and the way I've done all my companies is um, is to go very early. And that's not for everybody. But I think it 
um, I believe it, it starts to build your bench of supporters. Um, uh, it, it, it forces you to hone what you're doing and how you're thinking of things. It's, um, it's hustling from the very beginning. And if you're going to be successful, you're going to have to hustle and figure out how you can sell your thing to somebody. So you're selling an idea at that point. I mean, the very first company that I started, um, the first funding I got for it was, um, was from a, 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 a meeting with a, uh, an investor in town at a large venture firm um, when I was working for an investment bank and my boss at the bank happened to invite me to the lunch downtown. And so um, as we were walking out and my boss went into the bathroom, I pitched that guy on that idea. <laughs> and and he ended up um, he ended up uh, investing and, and got some other people investing. And so we cobbled together half a million bucks on this first company. It was a complete disaster. It lost everybody's money, including all of our own. Um, but uh, that person ended up being the key funder in the next company that I did because um, he believed in what me and the team were doing. And that company, we grew to $100 million in revs and, and $20 million a year in EBITDA. And so, and so I'm a believer that you go early. And, and, and Will and Alice are right that like not every, especially if you're just first time and you're starting doing it, you're not going to get some, you know, giant, you know, multi-billion dollar firm to invest in you, nor do you probably want that at that stage. But, um, you know, everybody, you know, knows somebody who knows somebody that, you know, has a little bit of money and can invest in something, right? I mean, it doesn't all need to start with, um, you know, a bunch of, you know, big institutional VCs. I just, I think the, what it forces you to do by raising that money early, um, even when it doesn't work out, is, is better than not doing. That's good advice. I think that uh, a lot there's a lot of value in hearing for, from investors and learning what investors look for, regardless of where you get your funding, because they are they have a lot of experience with a lot of kinds of deals. And so the questions that they ask will help you know whether you're on the right path toward a good business strategy. I'll just do a quick counterpoint. So I think that for the like a highly regulated space like pharma or if you have like a regulated device there's a lot of challenges to it as well and like no money is free so like absolutely like if you have money you have good partners you have the value add like alice is saying you have someone to bring those people on uh for like a, a pharma or biotech case if you have opportunities for non-dilutive capital and you're still in the university absolutely exploit that and get as far as you can so like one of the challenges that we see is someone says this is the right time. Like, obviously this, this clinical indication I'm going after is a huge market. So like, I want to get out now. And then you leave the university. It's a very different universe. After you leave the university, you don't have your salary. You don't have the instruments there you might need. And so I'd say go as far as you can with the, the resources around you, like we reach or other things that can help support you because uh, getting access to some of the uh, institutional infrastructure, if you're if you're a highly scientific or regulated technology outside university, is really really challenging. So I'd say you know coast off the wind of that as long as you can, uh, so that when you actually get out, you have momentum. People are excited to do it. It's really challenging when uh, you if you don't the, the 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 downside is if you come out too early and you're pitching people and there's a lot of work to do and you can't find funding for it, then you start to get sort of a perception of being kind of long in the tooth. So try to. Um, have that sense of like, this is an exciting opportunity. You've gotten far. And also like if you get an SBAR or you get, uh, you know, funding from uh, WeReach or WF or somewhere else, hopefully that's some sort of marker of credibility that investors can see and like, oh, smart people think this is a good opportunity. So and that's that's money without the dilutive effect that you're going to get if you're taking out private capital. So investor, you know, we have, we have to get, we have to keep lights on at the, at, at our firms and, you know, have return. And so, uh, there, there's a cost to that money, but if you can get some, you know, government funding or, you know, the support university, absolutely take that too. So we'll say a little bit about SBIRs, TTR. I don't, um, I, I've, I've never applied for an SBIR, but some other find the best person to speak to it, but it's definitely a good source of non-dilutive money and there's different mechanisms for it. So it's, it, my understanding is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars it has to have a company associated with it. When I see companies that get SBIRs, um, they're usually virtual. So you don't have to be a fully operational shop oftentimes. A, lot, a huge portion has subcontracted back to the lab and the university. Um, and so there's there's some gray area, I think, potentially as well, that even needs to be licensed uh, to the company. So sometimes the university still owns the technology even. Um, so I think that, it, you know, if you have that, it's, it's a long process. There's a certain set cycle for it. The application is, is non-trivial. It takes a lot of time. Most people don't get it the first time. You do a number of them. 
um, but it has a chance to have you get money to do technical development. And it's all, it's, it's, you have your, it's after you do the basic discovery. So typical NIH, NSF money, basic discovery, uh, proving a concept, but SBR money is like for business and commercial R and D milestones. And so, uh, it's a very, it's a valuable, uh, thing if you can get it. Uh, it's, it's hard to live off that long term for a company. So you want to find that that point from when you're going from non dilutive to uh, more of the traditional venture capital money. Um, so there is some uh, I think there is some information uh, from Life Science, uh, Life Science Washington Institute. Mm-hmm. They have they have information on SBIR, uh, SBIR and how to apply for their seminars associated with that. Uh, those are probably good resources to, to look for. Um, I, I know p- uh, projects that have been funded in the therapeutics area, so it is attainable and um, it, it is non-dilutive, so very good for especially early stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and don't get discouraged. Like at the statistics I've heard is like almost 90% don't get it the first time, but the second time around it's like 50%. So mm-hmm. you get it, you get feedback, and you, you, you do yeah. it again. And so you have to have a thick skin and apply to a lot of things and eventually it'll hopefully work out. Yeah, and there are some tricks to it, and we do have some resources and some experience in the uni- university and can help you. So let me know if uh, you're interested in that. And it is a really good way if you know you have some technical milestones you need to meet and you have your equipment and such in the lab. It's a really good way to build out your capability to do commercialization work while still being in a un- university, which it's sort of hard to come by that kind of money when you're in a research institution. So I helped a number of teams on their phase one and phase two SBIRs, and it's uh, gotten teams quite a long ways. Okay, so uh, last advice that you would give teams? I think we've covered a lot of territory. You have some last words before I ask for questions? Um, I would say kind of building on um, um, what was said, um, don't get discouraged. <laughs> you do have to have thick skin. When to be an entrepreneur, you're going to be told no, and there are going to be people who tell you you're you're uh, crazy. You're crazier. You're, <laughs> yes, you're crazier. Your your um, product <laughs> is worthless, and it's not going to go anywhere. Um, be open. Listen to all the feedback that they're giving you because you, you have to be open. You, I know it's your baby, but you you have to be open to to constructive criticism and be willing to make changes if they are necessary. But um, don't get discouraged. And uh, and don't have this mindset where I absolutely know where this is going to go and what it's going to be used for, because sometimes you, you start down that road and it takes a it takes a turn. It takes a corner. And sometimes that corner ends up taking to, you to an even better place. So just keep your mind open. Yeah. And uh, listen Derek, yeah, to that. Specific example. Yeah. Other wise words? Uh, this might not be wise words. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, definitely be persistent and open-minded, and those are not mutually exclusive. You can do both. And how many engineering and scientists are in this room and a technical background? So yes, a lot. And so um, one thing from technical background, folks with technical backgrounds, um, networking is not something that's natural to a lot of us. And so one thing is to be comfortable doing it, um, to network, to talk to people, to start getting feedbacks um, that feeds into the having thick skin um, and and use those opportunity as, as an opportunity to, to promote, but at the same time to learn um, and to just make friends. Um, you never know when you're going to be able to help someone and you never know who will be able to help you. Um, so be comfortable reaching out to people. You can start small by constructing the happy hours within your lab and then branch out to your department, branch out to other entities and and start there so that you get conversations rolling. Yeah, and you'd be surprised where some of your investment may come from. I've had people invest in our company who uh, just sitting at one of my son's basketball games talking to the people around me and before you know it, they're saying, oh, I'd like to invest in your company. That doesn't always happen like that, but, but it has happened. Um, so so that is something. I will say, and when speaking to investors, just because I've had this personally happen to me, where I made a presentation to investors, and it was a 10-minute presentation. And at the end of it, someone came up to me and said, nobody in the room knows what your device is. And, and I thought, 
like, oh my gosh, really? <laughs> so practice it on people beforehand. Practice it on, especially as engineers, and say, practice it on lay people who are not engineers or not scientific and make sure that they understand it, your presentation, um, because particularly when you go to investors, you really want them to come right. away from that knowing exactly what your device is or what your product is. Uh, one rule of thumb that uh, we usually tell people is that you should be able to tell your grandma what you're working on, even just your PhD <laughs> project. You need to be able to tell your grandma what you're working on within a minute. If you can't do that, then you probably haven't gotten the essence of what you're doing. So same thing with pitches. You should be able to describe, you know, elevator pitch. Really, you should be able to describe your project uh, during an elevator ride. Um, so get that down would be very beneficial. Okay, any questions from you all in the audience? It sounds like one of the risks of maybe going from academics to primarily working on a company is what you described, you sort of going all the way in and now the game will have to support salary. And, um, if you talk to people who are going to invest, how important is it to them that you have gone all the way in? That is, that you're not still. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it definitely shows a certain level of commitment and you have some people that have, uh, if you're hedging your bets too much, if you're feet in two boats, like they're going different directions, eventually you're going to have to make a hard choice. And so it depends if like the milestones are mostly technical and research based, like you can accomplish some of that while keeping your day job. But, you know, um, like everyone is saying, you're, you have to go out and talk to a lot of people. Uh, you have to, you have to network, you have to go to go down and do pitches. And if I know that someone is uh, financially attached to the consequences of the things not going well, they're going to work a lot harder to make sure it works. And so uh, you want everyone to have skin in the game and have similar incentives and uh, having a sense that, and this doesn't mean you ha have to leave right away, but I think having a sense that the, uh, the CEO is on the same page as the funder and has a financial incentive to make that work, eventually that, that has to happen and probably before you get to an institutional funder. I mean, there's, certain, there's a certain gray area before that you would have, um, um, but I, I'd say eventually it has to be the case. The question you're always asking yourself is, uh, you know, who's waking up in the morning, making sure my, my investment is well taken care of, you know, um, are they focusing on that or grading papers and doing committees and things like that? And, uh, you're going to meet a lot, like, you know, Alice is saying, meet people and go out, like you're going to meet a lot more people if that's your full-time job and you have to make it work. So I think eventually you have, you have to do it if it's going to be a sort of a large scale uh, venture backed, uh, thing. If it's going to be a lifestyle company, we're going to sell a little bit. It's going, to, it's going to supplement your income. That's a totally different thing. But if you're asking other people's money, uh, just making sure that they're aware that you're fully committed to it is, is a huge part of it. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I think it's well said. I would add that uh, my opinion of doing a bunch of these things is that it's, you know, the idea is 10% max of the opportunity. Maybe it's a little different if you get a patent on this or whatever, but I, I'm an execution CEO, and I think it's 90% execution. And if that's the case, then uh, your success is dependent on whether like, you, you can execute. Then um, you had, you have to be all in to be able to execute well. Um, it's anything you, I also believe this, anything you can think of, someone else has already thought about it. Anything you can think of, somebody else is already working on it, right? So it's going to come down to, can you and the team that you're part of execute, out-execute somebody else on it? Ranging, everything ranging from, raising money to finding customers, to building product, doing all that kind of stuff. Um, so it requires that level of commitment, not just of you, but, but of a team. Now, when I did CSATs, that was all the, that was the first one I did as a spin out of the university. So with an academic co-founder, all my other ones were gen generated uh, as EIRs inside of venture firms and things like that. Um, so it was, this was a dilemma with CSATs when we did it because my, my partner, um, you know, as the assistant professor here, he had clinical duties. He's a researcher. He ran the robotics program over at Seattle Children's. Like, he's a surgeon. Like, like those guys never sleep. And so, and so he was booked, you know, big time. And furthermore, we needed him to stay in that capacity because we were selling in the in the, the surgery, the, the surgical field. So it lended gravitas to what we were doing. Um, so what we did was we worked. He was our CMO. We worked out a deal where he was able to get a certain carve out of time from, from the university to focus on CSATs. And, and he served a pretty specific purpose in that, but the execution team that was there, you know, you know, at least thinking about this 24 seven, including dreaming about it, 
um, that was a that's a that's a different team, and you got to It wouldn't have worked if we if we had if we didn't have an execution team that was that was there was there full time. And so I think what I you know my advice would be as you asked me earlier, like before you embark on the journey, figure out what you really want, and if it's and then really ask yourself, do you have to do a startup to be able to do that? Right? It may it may be look, I really want to make an impact and change the world and so forth. Then I mean, you're at an awesome university here. You may be able to do that and not have to ever go through all the headache of starting a startup. Usually what happens, though, is if somebody kind of says, yeah, I want to change the world. And I also want to scale this and have this get to everywhere. You know, at some point it tips to, well, you know, it's kind of tried and true way of doing that is, you know, getting getting a business going, get a bunch of money behind it so you can go and scale it. And when you if you do go there, then, yeah, you've got to it doesn't have to be you necessarily, but there has to be an execution team that is committed to it. And investors will see right through it if, if, if that's not there. So I'd like to follow on that same sort of theme, just looking at it from the investor standpoint. When they're coming, when you they think you're ready, are they, are they scared off by the fact that you have not yet licensed your technology from the university? You're still considered a researcher. Maybe the company exists in a sort of a shell form, but has they haven't really made the leap. Do they want you to make the leap before they're going to give you the money? Or as long as the the concept in the how scared off are they about the fact that you haven't yet emancipated from the university? I guess I'm not asking from the investor side. Do you think you need to get to the point where you make a judgment call? I think we're ready for this kind of investment. We're going to make that step, and then people will feel more comfortable investing because our relationship with the university and the IP has all been resolved. Or can you? sort of stay in the mode of I'm a researcher, we'd like to start a company, we haven't done it yet, we're waiting sort of for the right opportunity, and then an investor comes along and says, this looks really interesting, let's figure out how we get you out of the university into a company. I'm just trying to get a sense of sort of how those dynamics do. I don't think an investor would be scared off because you hadn't licensed yet. I think most licenses, those problems can be solved, you know, and there's a, there's a pretty general standard range of possibilities for a license from universities. So it's really unusual to have now if you're licensing things from four or five different universities to make a platform work it becomes more complicated, but you can absolutely work through those in the university. They work really, really, really hard and well to ensure that um, investigators are well taken care of. They don't want to necessarily license it out to someone else or X, Y, or Z. So they're, they're on your side, they're on the university side, they're working really hard to make that work. Um, I think that there's that, that period of time where you're you're going to you're trying to see how far you can go in the university before it just becomes unmanageable to, to to go out. So, we have one company in our portfolio that's a genomics company, and they started operating as just like doing uh, little projects for the people on grants, and then they became a cost center, and then eventually it became like we have three or four postdocs on this. We actually can't just we have to do other things in the lab. You have to go out, uh, and so the CSO was effectively kicked out of the lab to start the company, and that's an example of where uh, you just kind of realize that point has come, and they were able to they were able to bootstrap in that example, but. Uh, you'll recognize when it's no longer a fit uh, in the university culturally. And in the meantime, I suggest, you know, talking with people, having having contacts. You don't want to have the first conversation be an ask. You want to have you want to find people that sort of understand the concept and are excited about it before you. And you're working with them. on What's the right scope of work instead of uh, going up and having a hard ask right away. Uh, but that doesn't happen. That takes multiple conversations. I mean, the, 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 the research I've seen on sort of going from. Uh, you know, a uh, n- number of conversations to a deal is like seven to nine conversations. So it's a lot of follow back, follow up, and it's a long period of time. So it doesn't, ha- it, it sometimes can happen fortuitously when you meet someone or, but usually uh, for a larger uh, funder or even for angel investors, it takes a lot of contact and a lot of coffee meetings with people that aren't going to invest to figure out who's kind of, who, who gets it right away and will be on your side. Thank you. Okay, well, let's thank our panel.